Our call to worship is from Psalm 98 verses 4 to 9. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord all the earth. Break out in loud songs and sing praises. Sing unto the Lord with the harp, with the harp and the sound of melody, with trumpets and sound of the horn. Make a joyful noise before the Lord the King. Let the sea roar and all that fills it, the world and those who live in it. Let the rivers clap their hands, let the hills be joyful together before the Lord. For he is coming to judge the earth with righteousness. He will judge the world and the peoples with justice. Our prayers of praise and adoration and thanksgiving. Father God, maker of everything, whose power is beyond our comprehension, we bring our thanks and praise to you. As we worship here today, we are filled with wonder and awe at the things that you have done for us. Given us a world filled with beauty and set before us everything we could possibly need for a life lived in your service. Be with us now in this time together and fill our hearts with the joy of being your children. Amen. And now our prayers of confession and repentance. Heavenly Father, we come before you as sinners. May we learn to forgive those who have hurt us as we would have you forgive us. We bring before you now our own transgressions, our sins of thought and deed, action and inaction, conscious and unknowing, accepting that these have hurt other people and so have hurt you. We repent these sins and seek your strength and guidance to become better than we have been, to work towards being as sinless as you would have us be. We ask these things in and through your Son Jesus Christ, by whose sacrifice we may be forgiven. Amen. Hear then the blessed assurance of Christ. Through him our sins are forgiven. Amen. Thanks be to God. We sing now our first hymn, singing the faith number 553, I am a new creation. We say now together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Let us pray. 
Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Our first reading is taken from the Gospel of John, chapter 15, reading from verse 9 to verse 17. I love you just as the Father loves me. Remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I've obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I've told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My commandment is this, love one another just as I love you. The greatest love a person can have for his friends is to give his life for them. And you are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer because a servant does not know what his master is doing. Instead, I call you friends because I've told you everything I have heard from my father. You did not choose me. I chose you and appointed you to go and bear much fruit, the kind of fruit that endures. And so the Father will give you whatever you ask of him in my name. This then is what I command you, love one another. So in that reading, Jesus talks about friendship and what somebody should do for their friends. And of course, he tells us that he's our friend and makes very clear what he did for us out of friendship. So, who has good friends? Hopefully, all of us. Quite where we draw the distinction between just friends and good friends is a matter of personal perspective as well as possibly being the title of an 80s sitcom. I don't know. But these friends of yours, how do you feel about them? Do you love them? That probably depends on your definition of loving them. Hopefully, whoever is your significant other, if you have a significant other, is as well as being the person you love in a romantic sense, they're also your best friend. I think if I'd said to my wife that she wasn't my best friend, I'd be in a lot of trouble. Personally, I have some good friends for who I would go and have gone a very long way to support and who I hope would do the same for me. I consider myself very fortunate to be able to spend two evenings a week in the company of these friends who I've known since I trained at university some 30 years ago nearly now and I have to say and I'm not bragging here but there are very few weeks in that time that I've not seen them at least once. In fact I think I only see my family more than I see them. So yes, I love them as family. So if you've got these friends that you love, how do you show that? Do they know you love them? Well. Have I ever explicitly said to these good friends of mine, I love you? No. 
not in words, but I hope through the way I've behaved and supported and the time we've spent together that they know that. But I don't know, maybe I should tell them. But how would you feel if one of your friends suddenly turned to you and said, oh, by the way, I love you. Hopefully you'd take it in the way they intended. But do you know that for sure? The friends that I have are so important to my wife and I that we ask them to be amongst the godparents of our two daughters. We wanted them to be a part of our family's lives. We've helped them at other times. We've helped them when they've moved. We've helped them move their own kids to university and back. We've helped them in difficult times and at very short notice. I hope they feel that we are there for them. There's no doubt that over the last year, staying in touch with friends has been very challenging. So how have you managed to stay in touch with friends over the last year? Zoom? Phone? House calls when, when it's permitted? I can hold my hand up to all of those. Just think though, how much more isolating it would be and isolated we would feel without those wonders of modern technology. Oh, I wish I'd bought shares in Zoom a couple of years ago. But not everyone's comfortable with technology. And if they can't access it or aren't happy accessing it, they may feel far more alone than we can ever appreciate. Inevitably, for each of us, there will be some people we've become distant from because of the social restrictions and all the other things that we've had to endure. The important thing is that once we start to move back to normal, are we going to try and rebuild those relationships, rekindle those friendships once restrictions allow us to? I think we've got to, haven't we? God is never in that position though. Jesus is our friend and speaks to us in our hearts, in our minds. He doesn't need Zoom. He doesn't make a phone call. He doesn't book an appointment. He doesn't have to wear a mask and keep two metres away. He speaks to us as though he's right there next to us. And if we become distant from him and need to rekindle that friendship, it's not his fault. It's ours. So how have the events of the last year had an impact on your friendship? Have they had an impact? Well, with those good friends, hopefully not, apart from the, the frustration of not being able to spend time with them in the way that we normally would. I feel incredibly fortunate that since my friends and I play board games together as our hobby. That's how we spend those two nights a week. We've been able to use various online platforms and continue our friendship and our interaction through the wonders of the internet. Even so, we still bemoan the fact that we're not meeting face to face. 
despite the fact that actually the internet's allowed us extra time because normally we'd meet in one another's homes and have to finish at a set time to allow for journey time to get home. Zoom allows you to recover that time. It's fantastic. We've had extra time together. Except we haven't been together, have we? We've just been talking online. How many of our friends are Christians? I sincerely hope that we're not limiting our own friendships exclusively to other Christians. Of my own friends, two of them have faith, but don't really call themselves practicing Christians. Although over the last few years, I have seen one of them move close to that. But sadly, I've also seen one have his faith challenged through the loss of his wife. Does his or your friend's lack of faith change your relationship with your friend? I don't think it does mine, but it might for you. Why should it though? More about that later. How do your friends feel about your faith? If our friends mock us about our faith, are they really our friends? That doesn't necessarily mean though that we should stop being friendly and most certainly we should be challenging their viewpoint. But we should also consider perhaps why they might be mocking it. Is it actually because they themselves are uncertain about what they believe? Do your friends support your faith? I'm quite fortunate. I think that mine accept it as part of who I am. And we do occasionally discuss aspects of faith. I know that when I started the Sunday afternoon board game activity at Beeston Methodist Church, one of them who really has only just started to move towards greater faith, although as I say, I don't think he calls himself a practicing Christian yet. He was one of the first through the doors, probably because he wanted to play board games, but it's got him into church and it's got him talking to other Christians. And that can only be a good thing. So my friends, yeah, they accept that I'm a Christian. They know I go to church. They know that if they ring me on a Sunday morning, they're unlikely to get an answer. But it doesn't make any difference to them. It's who I am and they are my friends. They accept me for what I am and I accept them for who they are. So we've got these friends. They may or may not be Christians. How much do you share your faith with them. How many of you will be saying to those friends who may or, as I say, may not be Christians, tomorrow will probably be going, oh God, we had a right one today. The sermon, oh, no, no good at all. He better not come again. Or are going, oh, greatest thing since sliced bread. In which case, mm, I'm probably bragging a bit.
The second reading is taken from Acts chapter 10, verses 44 to 48. While Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit came down on all those who were listening to his message. The Jewish believers who'd come from Joppa with Peter were amazed that God had poured out his gift of the Holy Spirit on the Gentiles also. For they heard them speaking in strange tongues and praising God's greatness. Peter spoke up. These people have received the Holy Spirit just as we also did. Can anyone then stop them from being baptised with water? So he ordered them to be baptised in the name of Jesus Christ. And then they asked him to stay with them for a few days. So, who do we share our faith with? Who do we share Christ with? How many of us are comfortable sharing our faith with people who are not close friends? Have we shared our faith with our colleagues at work? Yeah, they they might know we go to church, but how many of us discuss what that actually means with them? To an extent, human nature's working against us here. The majority of people aren't comfortable discussing personal things with people they're not close to. As a teacher, I discuss my faith with other teachers who I know are Christians quite regularly. But less so with colleagues who aren't. I find it difficult at times to discuss it with the students as well, even though some are very interested and are obviously starting to explore what they themselves believe. It's not easy, is it? But we have to ask ourselves, Who is God's love for? In that second reading, it's made quite clear, it's simple. The answer is, it's for everyone, regardless of whether they believe in Christ yet or not. God's love is for them. And when they become aware of God's love for them, then they might start to be Christians. One of the things we should be doing more is to perhaps be a bit more missional in our lives and to share that fact. So are we a select group? There's a real danger of Gnosticism here, that we take God's love and the patterns of church life and make it into secret rites and knowledge into which people are initiated and part could become part of this group with secret knowledge. Most definitely we should not be doing this and in his first epistle John writes to counsel against this. That's part of the lectionary readings uh, a few weeks ago. It's a constant risk though. Again, human nature and the desire to compare ourselves against one another and to form into tribes makes the idea of keeping Christianity for ourselves so that we are saved, whilst others perhaps aren't, an attractive idea a dangerous idea, a wrong idea. The reading that we've just heard shows this happening. A group of Gentiles, people who weren't Jews, very clearly became possessed of the Holy Spirit. They spoke in tongues and members of the group who considered themselves Jews were amazed at this. 
And Peter had to challenge them on it. Who here would withhold God's message from those people? The water of baptism. Who would keep them from that? Jesus is very clear in his message to his disciples go out and make disciples of all peoples and he draws no distinctions all peoples no keeping the knowledge secret for yourself and sharing it only with a select few all people So, how often do you share your faith with others who are not necessarily your friends? Probably not as often as we could or should. But as I said before, human nature makes it a daunting prospect. One of my favourite comedy shows, The Fast Show, had a recurring sketch in which someone each time from a different walk of life likened some event in the sketch to the love of our Lord Jesus Christ. Always improbably and in a toe-curling, cringeworthy way that ridiculed anybody really sharing their faith. And so it creates this sort of stereotype. A stereotypical view of Christians. And I've got to say, it was my favourite comedy show. It probably still is one of my favourites. But that part of it, I just, I don't find it funny. I find it very disappointing. But I also find it enlightening that people still have that sort of viewpoint. It's a viewpoint we need to challenge and change. But quite how is a really big, knotty problem, a big challenge. How missional are we? Do we minister to our communities? Do you know what? I've asked the question, but I'm not actually going to try and answer it. It's a question you need to yourselves. But it's something we all need to think about within the church. How much are we preaching to the converted? How much are we keeping God's message for ourselves and not sharing it? both as a community and as individuals. The problem is, how do we share our faith? What do we say without it coming across as this cringeworthy thing that people obviously have seen fit to turn into a comedy sketch? And it's the big worry for lots of people. I don't want to discuss my faith because I might get asked something and I don't know what to say. I came across a great piece of advice recently. It's from a, a friend who's a pioneer minister in the Church of England. And it was how to talk about your faith. And his advice was, talk about what you know. And if you get asked something that you don't know about, say, I don't know about that. But what I do know is this. And proceed to talk about your own personal experience of Jesus in your own life. At the end of the day, 
what you say then is probably more relevant to the person asking the question than we think. And it's certainly something we can speak on with some authority because it's what we know, our relationship with God. Yes, it might be growing, it might be developing, it's a continuing journey that we're on through the whole of our lives. But we know what's happening. We know what that relationship means to us and what its impact on our daily lives is. And that is what we can share. If we try to be the person with all the answers, that can be off-putting. And we might just get caught out. There's always some smart alley who keeps asking questions to see how far they can go before either you come out with some complete nut of rubbish or you have to admit, I don't know. And the later you leave that, the more authoritative you seem and then suddenly go, I don't know. The more your credibility sort of gets challenged. It's better to be honest and to be human. And as soon as there's something you don't know, don't try and fudge it. Be honest about it. I don't know. But what I do know is... So sharing God in our lives, it might not be easy, but sharing the joy of having God in our lives, of having Christ as our friend, our good friend, our best friend. The impact that has on our day to day life. At the end of the day, that's what anyone approaching faith wants to hear about. They're uncertain. They want to know more. They might not have made a decision, but they want to know more. They want to know, what does this faith thing mean for me? So tell them what it means for you. Friend or stranger, they want to know what being a friend of Jesus could mean to them and what having the love of such a friend has meant to each of us is a really good way of showing that and that way through us the kingdom can grow Amen
We come now to our time of prayers of intercession and these are adapted from the Methodist resource Not Alone. They are responsive prayers. When I say gracious God, please respond with hear our prayer. As we offer our prayers for the world and for ourselves, we will share in times of silence, allowing us to reflect on the needs of others and on our own experiences. As we reflect, it may be that God will speak into that silence and help us to understand the world and our lives in new ways. Let us pray. We remember creation breathed into life by God's Holy Spirit, places of beauty and brilliance, places of grandeur and spectacle, places of extravagant diversity. We pray creating God for places damaged and degraded, for people scraping a living from land made fruitless by human greed. Help us to live sparingly and to care for creation. Gracious God, hear our prayer. We remember humanity breathed into life by God's Holy Spirit. People of beauty and brilliance, people of gifts and grace, people of extravagant diversity. We pray healing God for people whose lives are diminished because of things beyond their control, for people facing stigma, violence, disability, illness, grief, poverty or loneliness, for people struggling to find help when they need it. Help us to be welcoming, helpful and more aware of those things that make for well-being for others and for ourselves. Gracious God, hear our prayer. We remember the church breathed into life by God's Holy Spirit, a community of beauty and brilliance, a community of love and compassion a community of extravagant diversity. We pray inspiring God for denominations working out how to be one family, offering an effective witness to your love in the world, for churches with projects that offer help to people struggling with different aspects of their lives, for ourselves and people in our own families and community who need to be understood, accepted and loved. Help us to be willing to change ourselves and inspired to change the world. Gracious God, hear our prayer. In the name of Christ. Amen. We come now to our final hymn, hymn number 407. Hear the call of the kingdom.
Let us go forth from here to live and work for Christ, sharing the good news of his love for us and showing what his friendship means in our lives and sharing that with others. And we say together the grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.